Okay, so good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Try again. There's not many of you today. Let's try again. Good morning, everyone. Ah, uh, thank you. Good morning, everybody. How are you today? I'm doing fine. How are you today? Good morning. 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 Good uh, as a reminder, of course, in about roughly a week, your uh, memos are due, so something to keep in mind. I can't remember the exact date, but you should look that up in the syllabus. Um, we did take some time, if memory serves, talking about the memo and expectations for Did you do that right? Am I remembering that correctly? We did? We did? Okay, great. So I went through, I showed you the, I showed you the sample one. So, let's take a few moments before we get into the thick of things and show you that. Now, when it comes to papers in my class, I have a rule that is, from what I understand, pretty unusual. Typically, in a lot of papers, what, is, what are the requirements for it? Page length. Page length. So what, what sort of page length are we talking about? A, a maximum page length. Minimum, right? Minimum page length, right? Is that what it's typically minimum page length? Is that what people typically say? So, but you will know, I don't do that. I don't say minimum page length. I say what? Maximum page length. Why do you suppose I do that? Okay, so that's a bonus. You don't have to read as much. You can that's it. Hmm? I'm looking for quality over quantity, right? And so that issue as well, as what Rebecca pointed out, I don't want to read all that stuff. That's a very overlapping issue because you might think, oh, David's so lazy, he just doesn't want to read a whole bunch. It's like the reality is if you are writing and someone's paying you to write something like for a job or something, they also don't want you to write a whole bunch because they don't want to read a whole bunch of unnecessary junk. Like, time is a scarce resource. They want to read stuff. Uh, that only takes a short amount of time. That's why, like, any long document, like if you look at any reports that any of the other government agencies bring out, for example, there's always the executive summary. Like, this is the one page of the key stuff, and then here's the details, if you want that. So being able to write briefly and concisely while still getting your point across is a very valuable skill. I know many people, both in government and in the private sector, who have to write as part of the job. No one ever says... My boss always complains I don't ramble on for like eight pages. No one ever says that they want more stuff even if there's no value in it, right? Being able to do things concisely is a very valuable skill. And you, you feel this way too, right? If there are two movies about um, the Civil War, which movie do you think is going to be better? The 100-minute movie or the 200-minute movie? The 100-minute movie, why? But the 200 minute movie is twice as long. It's got to be twice as good, right? Keeps your attention. Keeps your attention. Right? Won't be a lot of junk, as you point out, right? It's like, oh God, a three hour movie? Are you kidding me about this? What the hell is going on in this movie? Right? It's really got to work hard. And it's the same thing with any sort of communication. Right? Less is more. So I give you paid minimums. Now, just because I'm giving you minimums doesn't make it easier, because I'm sort of mean that way. Right? I also know that giving you less space makes it harder, because it's not merely, oh, you just have to write less. It's you have to write less, but still be complete in your analysis. Being able to do a lot of stuff in a small amount of space, that's actually pretty hard. We're going to know what you for. So, let's start with this document. 
So this is the thing that I usually talk about. I usually set aside a whole class you know, when we have extra time uh, to talk about it. But I don't want to get too much into it because obviously we're not trying to go through this whole thing. But this is more or less a sort of outline of things you should keep in mind when you write your memo. Uh, a couple of things I want to draw attention to. One, keep in mind that you will be picking one key variable and you will be constructing a thesis statement around them. Remember I have you have uh, three explanatory variables. You have to pick one of them for your memo. It's like, this is the one that I really want to focus on. This is the key part. This is the key uh, of my thesis statement. So you, of course, have a thesis statement. The other two variables will be controls. You'll justify why you're including the mess controls. And then your regression analysis is evidence for your thesis statement. So one mistake that I see people do, and I'm trying to eliminate that mistake by giving you, uh, by having you submit the regression analysis first. One mistake I see people do is that they will have a thesis statement of like population density cost of crime, and then they run a regression analysis, and the regression analysis shows no statistical significance whatsoever. If you don't have statistical significance, that's fine. But if you're going to do that, you got to change the thesis statement. It's got a max. It's supposed to work together. That's the whole point of the analysis. No, also, a thesis statement is not merely, I want to know the, what's going on. A thesis statement is making a declarative statement. You're not saying, here are some causes of crime or here are some causes of cancer. You are saying potatoes cause cancer or population density causes crime or income causes crime or something like that. So keep that in mind. Um, you can read the lines of those in the detail, but you know, be confident, be correct, don't let me all wussy about stuff. Like, I'm pretty sure you can also say, I can't tell that you have no idea what you're talking about. Don't be that person. Uh, I try to run about this for a minute. Let me try. <laughs> uh, keep it short, cut, and use some other phrases. This will help you stay on that uh, three page um, maximum. Also, review your work. Sometimes read your stuff out loud in order to make sure that it is uh, reasonable. Um, because I see a lot of awkward phrases, a lot of sentences, because you know, you're writing something and then you edit it a little bit and you edit it a little more and it doesn't quite follow. You sometimes see it in my notes too. I try to remove all that stuff from my notes, but sometimes you see something in my notes that don't make sense, it doesn't quite make sense. It's because I edited that part a lot and I just I missed it. So uh, I try to remove all of those. I uh, only have three pages to work with, so I expect that on you are going to go through and read out loud for you. Remove any of that nonsense. Uh, sometimes, too, people don't want to refer to themselves. I don't think that's a bad thing, so if you want to use I, I did this and that, that's fine. Uh, one reason, though, why I think people don't want to use I is they do, especially in stats, they do what's called, what I call, cooking show syndrome. So, cooking show syndrome, have you ever watched a cooking show on TV? And what do they do with the show? I will now add the flour. Let's take a cup of butter. And I will add the butter. So I can see you doing that. I don't know, maybe, maybe you just don't want it to be quiet, maybe you're trying to like, do it for people who aren't like watching the show or something, but I can see you doing it. I know you're having a cup of butter. It's on the other screen. What are you doing? Uh, in a paper, though, it's particularly egregious because people will say, I will now run a regression. And then they have a regression. It's pretty clear you ran a regression because I see the regression results. I don't think that you just made that up. So, again, to save yourself some space, avoid narrating what you're doing and then doing it. Just, just do it. And then I can see the results. Discuss it. But don't show that, don't say that you're doing these things. Also, don't use the word proof. As we talked about, uh, we have the central limit theorem. We haven't proved a damn thing. We only have evidence. So I don't care what your p-value is. It's still not zero. You might round it to zero, but everyone knows it's not zero. There's still some chance that that is coincidence. There might be some fault with a sample, whatever. The regression suggests I provide evidence that my study demonstrates that whatever. We haven't proved a damn thing. Also, keep your causation straight. Don't get your causation backwards. Um, you know, sometimes people will say income is predicting suicide as far as their thesis statement goes, but then they've they've got things backward and suicide ends up becoming 
uh, the independent variable and income is the dependent variable that got things backwards. So keep that straight. Uh, just as noted, just because you don't find this significant doesn't mean it's a bad thing. It means you have to rejigger your thesis statement. So you might say, people think population density causes crime because of these reasons. They are wrong because of these reasons. And here's the evidence. That's a perfectly way, that's a perfectly simple way to do it. Uh, structure, I give you a very basic structure here. Introduction, why should we care? Story, these are what other people have said about the relationship. This is the logic for why one thing comes here. This is essentially a proposal. If you want to reuse that proposal, that's uh, fine. Uh, you might want to you know, change the wording a bit for tightness purposes, but it's basically the same story. Go in the description of data. This is what you say what the variables actually mean. State the sources, etc. Uh, throw a table in. Make sure the table's easy to read. That's what you did with, it, with your table section. Description of statistics. You also have a table of your regression. You can discuss it. Uh, state your punchline. This is the key finding of your memo. This is something that you did on, on, on the exam. When I asked you to like, interpret this thing. For, uh, interpret the coefficient. For every additional value of every one more of x, there is this much more or less of y. That's the key finding. Of the, that's the whole point of the regression analysis. That's the key thing. For every additional thousand dollars of income, uh, crime falls by this amount of that amount. You can throw in a scalar if you want, if you want to change the value to make it a little bit more reasonable. Um, you know, but this is also why I gave you that stuff on percentage points versus percent, interpreting a dummy variable in case you want your dummy to be the um, and to be the dependent variable and so forth. Any questions so far? Yeah. I, yep. That was just for you. Yeah. We'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, also, make sure to include a complication section. So show there's no multicollinearity, which means you're going to have that table of correlation coefficient, something you've already done. Uh, and, they'll, and note that because this is again. Uh, an introductory course. So I am not pretending that the analysis that you've done is going to be like a breakthrough analysis. There's going to be problems in everyone's analysis. And the big problem in everyone's analysis is there's probably going to be some sort of confounding variable. So I think you should identify a confounding variable. Acknowledge that the analysis is not perfect. This is a really, this is a responsible way to do research. It also gives you a lot of credibility because if you're wandering around running this analysis, and there's like this obvious flaw that you don't point out, people are going to think that you're an idiot. It's also a really good skill in trying to dissect your own analysis and trying to do some critical thinking. So I suggest describing a reverse causation, but what I'm really looking for is a confounding variable. Try to identify a confounding variable. Another, I mean, I, I keep this a little open. I suppose it's possible that there's no confounding variable, but uh, there might be, for example, some issue with measurement but in general, I'm looking for a confounding variable uh, in this section, just to show that you understand you know, that this is not complicated thing you're working with. Uh, Any questions on that? So you can see this in my sample now. First thing I do is I explain to people why they should matter, why we should care uh, about how well students do in exams. If you look, we want to give people good advice, but you know, sometimes it's hard to do. Uh, I'm trying to really measure what really works. So let's just look at how long it takes for people to spend. And then I give a justification for why time it takes on the exam should have an impact. Note this is the bulk of my explanation because this is the this is my thesis statement that the more time people take in the exam the better off they do. Then I want to throw in some other stuff because I want some control so I can maybe one sentence explanation for each one. The one or two. Then I tell you what all this stuff is. I give you the details. I often tell you 
you know, in your tables to keep descriptions short because you have very limited space. So if you make a very long description for a variable, that's going to make this table huge. And it can always be small. And then you can tell me what time, I can tell you what time is right here. Time is how many minutes the student takes to complete the exam after 55 minutes. I could even uh, maybe like abbreviate this to like exam rather than exam total, and I could call this homework rather than homework average, and then describe, oh, homework is the average of the two homework assignments, because that would save me some space. I should probably do that. You know, balancing things aren't perfect, and not. Uh, There's no comparison analysis. No, I keep it tight with only the key information. Because there's a lot of information that Excel will show you that you don't really need, like multiple R or this is almost squares regression. You don't really need that information for this. This is just uh, this is just the key stuff, so people can see. Oh, look, that's statistically significant. That's not statistically significant. That seems like a pretty good model. The adjusted R squared is not great. Oh, yeah, 39 observations. Anyone who wants to read it and evaluate the paper and then it on its own on its own standard. And here's my punchline. For each additional 10 minutes a student works on an exam, that student's score increases by seven points. That's the key finding. That's the whole point of the analysis. And then I make a mention of, oh, this is actually pretty important. This is actually pretty big. Pretty big. Some commentary on if it's uh, um, practically significant is not a bad thing, if you can check that. And if it is practically significant. Then I just give you a general thing. Here's my correlation table. I sort of did, I need to fix this because I broke my own rule about how many decimal places there are. I just went nuts here. I need to fix this a little bit. I apologize for that. Ignore that. But I give some overarching, you know, I, I comment on some other stuff. I comment on the, um, on the model in general. But the most important thing is I talk about confounded variable. Maybe there's something else going on here that I can't measure that's causing by independent dependent variables. I know this is not conclusive. And in case of four, I tell that story about how I told people that, oh, if you spend an additional 10 minutes, you get seven more points. And then I lost all statistical significance when I reran the regression for another group. And I think it's because people weren't actually doing anything with that 10 minutes. Uh, that would be the diligence showing up, right? Yes, they were spending more 10 minutes, but they were using it to be diligent. That assumes the time spent on the exam is productive. And, uh, yeah, Lisa. I think so, but I don't know. I mean, what I really should do if I was serious about this research project and an idea is I would be recording times more. I might do that in the future. Um, but just any more data and more observations. I could even do it because I have so many sections now of the same thing. I could do like one section I tell them and one section I don't and play around with that. It could be fun, but uh, I haven't got around with that yet. And then I just conclude on the general idea. So again, as I felt, I have these notes at the end. Like I keep the table, even though the paper is double spaced, the tables are are not. The reason why you uh, double space college papers one is so that I can put notes in and you can see them and read them. But uh, because I don't typically need that many notes in a table, it looks better if a single space. Save your room too, and that's going to be really important. Uh, I don't comment on the intercept being statistically significant. It's not really important. Who really cares? It's just the intercept. Uh, we talked about this punchline issue, how I changed it from one minute to ten minutes because 0.7 is awkward. Um, don't really talk about the other things. Like, okay, year wasn't important. Yeah. So, year wasn't important in my thesis. I don't want to comment on it. Um, I didn't really use any sources, just that one. So, in theory, you don't need any sources. If you want to source anything, you're welcome to. It does not count towards your page one. Uh, for me, the hardest paragraph to write is the first paragraph, but it might be different than you. So if you are writing it and you get stopped in the first paragraph, just write the other parts. I think I wrote the first paragraph last. Uh, first sentence two is also really important. 
you know, murmur the idea of italic sentence. Any questions? No? Great. Okay, so let's um, move forward. So what we're doing now is we're going to dive into probability, which is our very last unit. Probability is uh, sort of separate from the other stuff. It is definitely statistics. It definitely has a lot to do with statistics. It's about uncertainty, and a lot of stats is about uncertainty. But it's different and distinct from the other material because the other stuff we clearly built on. I had to, we had to understand mean and standard deviation so we could understand uh, hypothesis testing. We really had to understand hypothesis testing so we can evaluate individual variables when we did uh, uh, multivariate regression. So there's a natural progression there. Probability is something which I put at the end because it's the one part that doesn't directly help you want to do your memo. Uh, and at the same time, it's so really boring. So that way, I don't feel like you're being shortchanged at all. I used to do this with like the, the uh, regression at the end, and then people had to like race to do their memo. So now you have lots of time for your memo. So I expect great things. But it's still probability, so really important. In order for us to get a good understanding of probability, though, uh, we first have to think about how statisticians convey it. We, when we work with probability, we're always going to be working with equations. So it's really important that we're all on the same page when we talk how to express probability. We never express it as a percent. We never say, oh, 5%, so we'll put 5 into the equation. 81.2%, so we'll put 81.2 into the equation. We never do that. What do we do instead? Shana, what do you think we do instead? Turn it into a decimal. So what would be 5% as decimal? Mm -hmm. And 81.2. Exactly. But note this results in the probability always being no less than what? No less than what? No less than zero, no greater than one. So it's always going to be between. Zero and one. I guess it can it can close up, right? It includes zero and includes one. But we also have to understand how we can not manipulate, but interpret probability. So what I have here is I have uh, a die. It has eight sides on it. Does anyone know what this is called? So, you could call it an eight sided die or call it octagon. I was wondering if anyone knows what nerds call it. This is my nerd test. No? No one? D8. Home D8. So, uh, for a little background, one of my hobbies is I play Dungeons and Dragons. And Dungeons and Dragons require you to roll lots of different dice uh, because different weapons deal more damage than other weapons. So and I think this is, for example, I believe this is a long sword. I think long swords use D8 as well as a bunch of other stuff, and that determines how many, you know, how much damage you do. Uh, and there are D12s, and there are D4s, and then there are D6s, which is the one that everyone's familiar with. Um, this is a D8, and we say D8 because I have more weapons. So it'd be 2D8 or 3D8 or 4D8. And as much as I would love to make this a course about knowing how to play Dungeons and Dragons, which I sometimes think I should just do one day and see if anyone notices in <laughs> administration, uh, I've read the statistics. And the D8 is also helpful for this. What is the chance of rolling an 8 on an 8 sided die? 12.1%. 12.1%. 12 12 12 or. 
0.125, I like how you're doing it, Michael, because you're doing it in that form. Right? 0.125, all right, or one eighth chance. Same thing, uh, what's the chance of rolling a seven? Same. Six. Because mm -hmm. assuming it's a fair die, each side has an equal chance. There's eight sides, one out of eight, 0.125. What is the chance of rolling a six? I'm sorry, what's the chance of rolling an eight or a seven? Why do you say 0.25? CJ. Ah, why do you do that? Because it's too bad. What would be a 1, 4, or 6? 0.375. Because you did. Or 1 8 plus. 1 plus 1 8. 3 eighths, right? Uh, why can we do that? Why can we say or? Why, why, I'm sorry, why can we do addition? Yeah. Okay, so let me ask you this to Michael. What is the likelihood of you showing up to class? I'm not saying it. It's a Thursday. Because I was teenage on this. <laughs> <laughs> what about Thursday? What's the chance? What do you think? I hope so. I don't think so. I mean, I don't think so. I mean, even I don't think so. I don't think so. Because there might be no man. You're not saying you might fall asleep. You might know, have uh, something else to do. Like your members. You might not feel well. So, it's not a one. What do you suppose the chance is? Give me an estimate. I'm not going to hold you to it. Okay. That low? Maybe I might have to hold you to that. <laughs> that low? Okay, think, think, think previously. Have you been to every single class? No. No. So we maybe have what, like 20 classes roughly? Mm -hmm. How many have you been to? Okay, so what would that be? Uh, about like 90%. Hmm? 90%. Well, don't tell me 100% when you've missed two classes. Clearly it's not 100%. I got a statistical evidence that says it's not. CJ, so roughly, what do you think the chance of you coming to class is? On, on, on uh, Thursday. 95%. 95 percent. He's got to outdo Michael. So, what's the chance that either of you come to class? What's the chance that Michael comes or CJ comes? You see problem? Yeah. Why do you say 85? Is it um, 0.9 times 0.95? Well, why did you just, wait, 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 wait. I said, what's the chance of rolling a 1, a 2, or a 3, or whatever I said? Uh, 7, 8, or 9, or whatever. 7, 8, or 6. Uh, and you said, oh, well, you used or, so you add them together, and you got 3 eighths. That makes sense. But then I asked you, what's the chance of you or Michael showing up and you multiplied? And by the way, you got a lower number too. The chance of uh, either one of you is showing up is lower than the chance of just one of you showing up. What? I thought it was the chance of both of us. No, I asked you the chance of, uh, I said or. Chance of Michael or CJ. So, anyone? What should we do? Well, that seems cheating because there's a 5% chance that Michael will, sh there's a 5% chance CJ will show up and Michael will, and that sounds zero. Right? 
So what, but why don't we just want, why, why can't we just add them? We did the, we did adding over here. It was super easy. I'm going to just add them. We take, uh, and we got, there we go. Yeah. Why isn't it that? It's higher than 100 percent. So what's different? Like that, so that's weird, right? Because it can't be higher than one. So what's different about this scenario that's not that's not the same about this one? Maybe uh, maybe being optimistic as to maybe he was lying, and maybe that's is also 0.9. Could I do it then? And now I get 1.8, and that's fine. No, I think it's more interesting if they're different. So we'll just go back to that. So it's not because they're different. What did I say here? I can't even remember. I think I said like I think unfortunately I picked three random numbers. I think it was like, I wrote like a four, a six, and a seven. We'll say it was that. Can CJ and Michael be here at the same time? Yes, they're here, right now. If I roll a D8, can I roll a six and a seven at the same time in the same world? No. These are what we call mutually exclusive. That different outcomes can't happen at the same time. And if they're mutually exclusive, you can add them. Say so this scenario over here plus this scenario over here. Or CJ show up. How would we figure that out? Yes, I'm just guessing. Um, is it 0.995? Why do you say 0.995? Because you have to get the 95% of 10%, they might just not come. I'm sorry, what's that again? So you have to get 95% of 10%, they might just not come. So they could yeah, take the 10% of, oh, I think you're going with this. Uh, yeah. Anyway, say again? Yeah. Okay. Um, let me ask you this. What is all? I want to go back to what you were saying. Uh, yeah, what do you mean 0.995? Because since that was coming 90%, he would not likely become with uh, 10% and 10 times 95, which is, yeah, 10 times 95 is 0.95. So. Well, 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 wait. I like I like where you're going with this, but I think it's interesting. But I want to want to unpack a little bit. Let's build a box. Okay. 
So put Michael here, 0.9, which means, as you pointed out, there's a 10% chance he doesn't show up. And CJ, 0.95, and there is a 5% chance you do not show up. So this leads me to the next question. What are the chances that they both show up to class? How would we figure that out? That's what we multiply the two. Why does it make sense that you multiply the two? Exactly. Independent. You can multiply probabilities. So Adding is typically a re uh, reference to the word or. I roll a one or I roll a two. CJ shows up or Michael. Independent is a reference to, or the, the uh, multiplication is a reference to and. I roll a one and I roll a two, well that can't happen. But maybe I roll the die once and then I roll the die again. What's the likelihood of me hitting a one two times in a row? Noting, of course, that each roll of the die is independent. Just because I roll a one once doesn't I mean I'm going to roll more or less likely to roll another one. What would be the probability of rolling the dice the die twice? I'm sorry, I get a one both times. One out of sixty-four. Right. This becomes important, by the way, if you are attacking <laughs> someone. Um, and you're like level five and you're hitting him with a ray of frost and you up it at, I think it's level five, yeah, it ups it to a 2d8 and now you're wondering like what's the likelihood that I'm only gonna only gonna deal two damage to this idiot and uh, it would be the probability of getting two ones which would be one out of 64 because you multiply it would be one eighth times one eighth I should just totally restructure this so that it's all about probability of <laughs> Dungeons and Dragons <laughs> There's like a lot, like in the new edition, like in order to do anything in the game, you roll a, a d20 to see if you hit somebody, and then if you are in a good position, uh, the game gives you a mechanic called advantage, which means you roll two 20-sided die and they take the better of the result. And so we can show some statistics to show how advantageous advantage is based on certain conditions of what die you want or what result you want. Uh, I should totally restructure the class if we do that. I was doing that for fun earlier. So, what is the likelihood of Michael and CJ showing up? Eighty-five point five percent. And how did you get that? So it'll be 0.885. What's the likelihood of... I should probably label this. Um, Michael showing up in CJ not. By the way, you did not have to run that number yourself. I know you're like, I'm going to pay 0.9 times 0.05. That's intimidating. But keep in mind, if you take these two together, it has to equal 0.9. CJ will either be here or not be here. Which means this combined has to equal all the, you know, Michael shows up and he either sees CJ or doesn't see CJ. So these two together has to be the probability that Michael shows up. So you could just know, oh, this is 0.855. Well, the only way to get to 0.9 is to take 0.9 minus 0.855 to get to 0.045. 
which means you should be able to tell me what this is. No. So you can either just take this and move it one decimal point over to the left, or you can note that, huh, that is, if we remove that 5, that's 0.85, which is uh, 0.1 lower than that. So if we add that 5, then that means the 0.1 will go down by 0.005, and that'll be 0.095. It takes you to the same place. Add these two together, and you get 0.95. And what's this one right here? Point zero zero five. Again, if you take these two and add them together, you get point one. If you take these two and add them together, you get point oh five. So, what is the likelihood that Michael or CJ will show up? Point eight five five. Because we're, by the way, in this scenario, it's not only or, it could be and or, right? So or means at least one of these things happen. In this scenario, you take this one, plus this one, plus this one. This can happen. Uh, this can fulfill the requirement, or this can fill the requirement, or this can fill the requirement, and you get, what was it? I already forgot what it was. Well, yeah, nine, nine, five, there it is. That's one way to do it. What's another way to do it? In other words, keep in mind that the likelihood of all scenarios must equal one. If you add up all the different possibilities together, they have to equal one. So if you know, well, I want to know See, Michael or CJ shows up. That means the only way to not fulfill that requirement is neither show up. What's the likelihood neither shows up? 0.055. 1 minus 0.055 equals 0.955. You can go that way. You can also, let me actually put in all of these things. You can also do it, so you can do it this way, point. Oh, four, five plus point eight five five plus point oh nine five equals point nine five. You can do it this way. You can also do it this way of point nine plus point nine five minus. Point nine times point nine five. If you're curious what the overlap between this and the other one is, you can just add the probabilities together and subtract off the part where they overlap. And if you wanted to know what is the probability that only one of them shows up, you can then again subtract off the part that they overlap. Do this twice. And then you only get these two corners. The reason why you subtract it off once is you're kind of you kind of counting this, and then you count it this way, and you're sort of counting this area twice. So if you subtract it off once, then you only get uh, these three. Subtract it off twice, then you only get these two. A lot of different ways to get the same result, but if you begin to appreciate the symmetry between all. Great. Let's kick it off. Oh. Uh, let's imagine you were a construction company. 
and you have this new project that the company is about to start on and the client wants to know well, how long is this going to take how long will it take well from previous projects you know that demolition uh, there's a 40% chance or we'll just say 0.4 that will take one month but sometimes weird things happen and you know there's a 60% chance it just takes two but once demolition is complete, then you build the foundation. And you know, it's a little bit more, if things go perfectly, probability of 10%, uh, it takes only four months to build the foundation. There's a 40% chance, however, that it'll take five months. And there's a 50% chance that it will take six. Finally, there is the actual building itself. And it looks like I got a 20% chance that it could take just six months and an 80% chance it will take seven. So, I have two questions for you, a simple question and a hard question. The simple question is, what's the range of how long this will take? What's the best case scenario for the worst case scenario? Ooh, this is a great chance to call on someone. Oh, this will be fun. Uh, sure a David. Is David here? Oh, David. Oh, uh, everyone is the best case scenario, absolutely. And 50 months is the worst case scenario. How'd you get that? Uh, I have the bonus number. Mm -hmm. One. Right. Yep. Two plus six plus. So now here's a harder question for all of you. What's the most likely time to completion? How would we figure that out? What's complicated about that answer? Well, about that question, I should say. Why is it hard to just look at this and see what's the most likely time to completion? Anyone? I'm not asking for an answer, I'm asking for why it's hard to figure out. Yeah. Yeah, there's lots of ways to get to like, there's only one way to get to 11 months. There's only one way to get to 50 months, but there's multiple ways to get to 12 to 13 to 14 months. So, in order to understand what's going on, we're going to have a tree diagram, which will diagram all the different possible scenarios. I'm going to put it over here because I want to then do the same diagram in Excel and I want to sh uh, because we don't want to do the math that comes with it by hand. I want Excel to do it, but I want to see, you just see the symmetry and where it's coming from. So let's start here, about midway. This is going to be our first decision node with the demo. You want to get a lot of space because then you're going to have to, each arm is going to have to have a foundation. And then each one of those arms is going to have to have a building. By the way, how many different combinations are there? Does anyone know? Twelve. Who's the twelve? That's how you get twelve. Anita. Exactly. And you're going to see that play out as I build this. So let's first make our demo part of the tree. And I think in my notes, I put months on the top and probability on the bottom. I just label things P for probability. Um, to make sure this is not a lot of space, though, because we can get kind of crowded. I might even bring that down a little bit. There we go. So, we're going to say one month, so 
probability of 0.4, and we're going to say two months is a probability of 0.6. Now, from that, This thing right here, this is the foundation stage. So we will have a 4, at point 1, if that's going to happen, 5 at point 4, and 6 at point 5. Then we're going to do the same thing right here. Four months. At point one, uh, five months at point four, and six months at point five. Then each one of these has a different building phase, or a different building result. This is where it gets a little crowded. I didn't do this right. It's really hard to do. I really should work backwards, but that's okay. So that was uh, that's four months. So the building, uh, the actual building, when we had uh, six months here at point two, and seven months at point eight. Six months, seven months, point two, point eight. And you just do that over and over again. Six months, point two, seven months, point eight. Six months, point two, seven months, point eight. Six months, point two, seven months, point eight. And finally, six months. Point two and seven months. Point eight. This is a big diagram. But again, it illustrates though all the different things that can happen. Each one of these scenarios, by the way, is mutually exclusive. This can happen where there's a really great thing with a foundation and then sort of average for everything. Oh, great building though. And this can't happen. These can't happen at the same time. These are mutually exclusive. How many months does it take for this first scenario? Seven. 11. And then? 12. This is also 12. And then we go 13 and 13 and 14. And it's the same thing right here, just one added everything. So this is a, this is a 12-monther. That's a 13. That's a 13. Uh, that should be a 14, and a 14, and a 15. Note that 13 then is the most uh, common result. There's two here and there's two here. Any questions so far? Okay, so we have 12 different scenarios. How likely is the 11-month scenario? What is the probability that that 11-month scenario will occur? So, that would be true if the probability of every arm was the same. So, if this was a 50% chance it takes one month, and a 50% chance it takes two months, this was a third, a third, a third, and 50 and 50. And if you take 0 0.5 times point, uh, would you take, if you take 1 over 2 times 1 over 3 times 1 over 2, then you would get 1 out of 12. But that's not the case here. So how do we figure that out? I'm going to bring this down. What do you think? So what's the probability that we would know it takes 11 months? 
Eight percent. How did you get eight percent, Michael? That gives us not not eight percent, point eight percent, right? Point zero zero eight. So if we wanted to figure out what was the most likely scenario, what was the most likely time frame, we would have to then take those multiplications and we have to do that 11 more times, which I don't want to do, you don't want to do, let's do it in Excel. The next thing about these, is, look, I, again, I want to flip these up next to each other so you can see how what I'm going to do here maps precisely the data over there. It's helpful though that the first thing we do is we name the scenarios. So let's have so the first thing we can understand is I, I highlighted uh, row one and I hit bold. So then everything is bold in row one. That's going to be my titles. This is going to be scenario. Scenario. But I can do one, and two, and three, and maybe highlight all the way down. The second thing is, this is the time it takes. Everything else, 11, 12, 12, 13, 13, 14, 12, 13, 13, 14, 14, 15. Again, I'm just taking this right here that we calculated. 1 plus 5 plus 6 is, uh, is 12, and 1 plus 4 plus 7 is 12, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. I'm doing, I'm just copying that down here in our time. So, how are these so far? Now, I'm going to do different things that we're going on. And what I want to do is I want to repeat this same thing over here. Now, what did these top six scenarios have in common? Anyone? What do these top six have in common? Yeah. Exactly. In all cases, the demolition took uh, a one month. There's a 40% chance of taking one month. So we'll get 0.4 and we'll just copy the basic down to the same other And these bottom six have a probability of 0.6. Right, this will happen because that's what these all have in common is that the demolition took two months and it's a 0.6% chance that I'm blocked. Okay, so now what do we do? Uh, now let's take a look at a sum. So we got all of these here in the same place. What do uh, what do these two have in common? Point five. Let's talk about these. Point one, right? Both of these took a uh, four month time for the foundation. What did these two have in common? Mm -hmm. The point five. Both of these took both of these took five months for the foundation. What did these two have in common? Six months for the foundation, or point five. So we can do point one twice. Now, in this scenario, everything is independent, or in this situation, everything is independent. So, this right here is exactly like this right here. So, what I want to do is I want to finish this section here, and then I can just copy and paste it right here. It'll be the same. Because this this tree right here is identical to this right here. Uh, obviously, excluding the month part. So this part right here is identical to this right here. So let's take a look at these. So this would then be, for 11, this would be what? 0. 0.2. And this right here? And this right here? And this right here? 
etc., etc. Right? So we can do font two or eight. Copy and paste, copy and paste. And then I have this. And then just copy the whole thing and paste it. Oh, I copy and paste it. This is easy to do, and the other thing is the other stuff in there. Do I get this? Any questions? No? Okay. Now, how do we figure out the probability for each scenario? So there's two ways to do it. One is to, one is to, uh, first of all, the eight time. And then you do it like, or imagine if you had like not three different factors, but like twelve different factors. Are you gonna hit in? Okay, B1 times I'm oh, sorry, it would be C1 times D1 times E1 times F1 times G1 times H1 times I1. Are you gonna do that? Is there a faster way to do this? I'm not saying that what CJ says is wrong, it's perfectly acceptable, but it's one of the way to do it. You know what CJ puts out, you know how to do something to be too. But I mean, what do we want? The, um, if you add a bunch of stuff together, it's called the sum. If you multiply a bunch of stuff together, it's called the product. Oh, look at that. Four minutes. It is kind of a lot of stuff. You can also get it here. It also gives you this green triangle right here. It's just Excel's way of saying this is weird. Because before you're just putting numbers in, and now you have like, you see that sometimes, but you can also afford it. The formula omits adjacent cells. Update a formula to include cells. It's just, it's noticing you're doing something a little strange than what you were doing before. But we uh, know what we're doing on this one. I think it's going to be more better. Sometimes it's going to seem like a green triangle, like whatever. I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, obviously, though, we don't want it just for this. We want it for all of them. So, what do we do? We are drag, drag it, or we can just, you know, we can pass it. Oh, it's going to do it for all of those. Fine. Let's do the whole thing. How about all that? Now, that's a lot faster, right, than having to... And meanwhile, in the other scenario where I'm just like, okay, 0.4 times 0.5 times 0.2 is what? Right, like, we're done. Kind of. So, note in this case, this happens and this happens and this happens, we multiply. But that's not really what I wanted. What's the matter of what? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So why are we talking about the 11 month, the 12 month, the 13 month, the 14 month, the 15 month? Right? Because 11 and the 15 month. What is the line that's going to be taking 11 months? Uh, it's mm -hmm. This one's boring. There's only one way for it to take 11 months. It's boring all the way. Here's what is interesting. What is the series of it taking 12 months? And how do you get 0 0.076? First, I made it easy, so I like I went to the data that I stored. Oh, you can do that, yeah. I think I'm not smart. I just went on my in column G and I just like stumbled up like the little ones that had the same. Yeah, so I was going to have you identify them individually, but you can do an add in to sort of them, which is also really clever and a great idea. But we can do 12. You can get to 12 months by doing scenario 2, by doing scenario 3, by doing scenario 7. So you're going to add them together. I like what Adam did, though. I think it's a lot easier. Let's do that. So, anyone who's not adding, what does Adam do? 
it's a sword sign. Yeah. Sword. Yeah. Sword. And then what? Sword and sign. All swords. Boom! All together. And now we can just find them all really easily. Some of those together. Again, yeah, this is that war function, right? The one we use in the end. Uh, demolition takes one month, and, and Thunderstick takes five, and Bullet takes seven. Now it's like, or this is Bullet takes six. Now it's like there's other ways to get to 12. This happens when this happens when this happens, so we have to use some. Uh, how many series do we have at 13? How many snares do we have? 14. Three. We got these last three right here. And then just to make it symmetric for uh, 15, we'll snare 12. So, which outcome is most likely? Which outcome is most likely? 14 months. Hmm? 14 months, right? Easily 14 months. How do you know? Appreciate the fact. Yeah, this is bigger than that. was a boring question, right? Appreciate the fact that um, even though there are three scenarios that are 14 months and four scenarios are 13 months, the 14 month one is more likely. Notably so. In fact, there's only one scenario for 15, there are four ways to get to 13, and they end up being about equally likely. And then there's this graph over here. A year? That's stupid. A year or less? That's not happening. <laughs> it might, it might, but it probably won't. What happens if you add all these together? You get one. And of course, you do that mentally. Or you just know it should be. It should be. It should be. And this is a question. It's never, I mean, I agree. It actually should be. It's never a bad idea to have just to make sure. Because that's a way to detect if you did something wrong. If it doesn't equal one, then you're missing something. Or you're adding too much stuff. Of course, it's equal. Um, does anyone have any questions? So, the whole point of me showing you how to do this is thinking in terms of, of tree diagrams helps you make sure that you capture all the different scenarios, all the different things that can happen. I also did the same thing too, I erased it, but when I did the, the little table, that was me showing you all the different possibilities. And the easiest mistake you can do in, in probability is to miss probabilities or double count things. And, and then you get you know the wrong answer. Then you, you're way off on your probability. So it's possible to make a list of everything that you want. But sometimes that's not possible. Sometimes it's not possible. Yeah. Sometimes it's not possible. Yeah. Sometimes it's not possible. Let's imagine that there are four students in the class. Four. Two of them are going to be like the only students that show up. I'm going to assume that they're 80 or something. Well, no, no, we can't do that because I want them to be. So two of them are people only sometimes show up. Uh, one of them shows up a lot. Uh, one shows up a fair amount of time. So we have uh, 0.5, 0.5 in the nationals. What is the likelihood none of them will show up? What is the chance none of them will show up? Well, let me actually start with what is the chance all of them will show up? Assuming again they're all in and what's the chance all of them will show up? Don't know. Zero percent chance? Is a zero percent chance that all of them will show up? I don't know. The point five might make it unlikely that they all show up, but I don't know if it's zero. Yeah? 0.1575. I just get 0.1575. It will depend on them. Exactly. 
Because again, this person shows up, and this person shows up, and this person shows up, and this person shows up. And that would be for uh, not even a 16% chance I'll have a full class. That's pretty sad. Prime is really low. So what's the chance that none of them will show up? That's interesting. So why do you want to say that? Uh, you subtract all the you subtract the amount of possibility. Okay. So you're but you're assuming that the only things that can happen is either they all show up or none of them show up. Is that the case? No. What did you actually calculate the probability of? What is this actually? Hmm? What do you mean either? There's four people here. At least one person showing up. So when you do the one minus, always think in terms of you are essentially making a line of either this or this scenario. So if you're saying one minus this, you're saying everything that is not this, which includes one person show up, two people show up, three people show up, and uh, all four show up. So, we want to figure out what's the chance that no one shows up. What would that be? How'd you get that? I took the chance that no one shows up. What would be the chance that no one shows up? No, it's only this one. Like five, or one minus point five is point five. Like five, point one is like seven. Or four is like seven. I thought you tasted it. That's the chance no one shows up. Because this is the chance any one person doesn't show up. And that's the chance no one shows up. And what's fun is now we can figure out what is the probability that at least one person shows up, but not everyone. How would we figure that out? Yeah, CJ. So one minus point of that. Well, that would be that would be um, at least one person show up. I wanted at least one person show up, but not everyone. So I wanted one. Two or three. What's this right here? Hmm? What was that? At least one person shows up. At least one person shows up. Um, wait. Is it, this was the probability everyone shows up. This is the probability of not everyone showing up. This is the probability of no one showing up. So, Anisha? So if, um, if this is everyone, or not everyone, this is no one. This is um, zero to four, right? Because this, this is uh, zero to four, right? Because this is all. This is not exactly five. So this is going to be everything. I'm oh, sorry. This is zero. To four. Zero to three. This is all four. This is zero to three. This is zero. Oh, that's it. That's all I see with that story. It's, it's pretending I'm being subtracting. Um, so this is four. This is zero. This is zero to three. What's one to three? zero to three, we'll subtract off the ones that are exactly zero, and now we'll get one to three. Uh, 
Uh, granted, this is a pretty simple thing. It gets trickier if we're working with, okay, how many, what's the probability of exactly one person showing up? If we did one person showing up, then we would take uh, the probability this person shows up times the probability times all the sum of these, of the, the product of these. Pro plus the probability that this person shows up times the product of these. The probability that this person show up times the product of these. The probability that this person showing up times the product of these. You know, there'll be four different ways to get one person showing up. So we'd have to do all of those scenarios, just like we did here. Now it gets a little complicated because this is just a way to show you, hopefully get you some familiarity and some comfort with thinking in terms of what it means to have zero to one. Uh, this is also a relatively easy thing because I'm working with Chuck and it's working with people. Um, there's no half person showing up and so forth. Uh, this is um, this is a uh, not that kind of situation. This is a simple version of that. Um, but that basic theme is all we're going to be working with uh, as we move forward. And, uh, and that's kind of going to be how we need to respect the value, which is even more interesting and more fun. So I will see you then. Have a great couple of days, everyone. Have a great couple of days.